This is an impromptu time of singing and worshiping before the Lord. No, I'm not perfect, and I don't guess any of us are, but we need to honor him. This is his day. This is his way. This is his time. We need to lift him up and honor him. You are worthy, Lord. We thank you. Lord, may we declare what thus saith the Lord, that the people may hear your heart and be obedient to your word, that we will do as you say to do, that we will be your children, that we will magnify and glorify your name, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're here. We thank you, Lord, that you will honor your name, that you will glorify yourself in the midst of the people, that they may see you high and lifted up. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the work you are doing in this house. Thank you, Lord, for how you are raising up your children in a new and different way for us. Not that it's new to how people worship you and honor you, because all over the world you have breathed 
your life into your people. I guess we're just a little slow to come on the scene with real worship, Lord, that will honor and glorify your name. You know, every person that is seated in their homes, in their car, you know where they are. You know how they're crying out to you for your voice. Mm. Lord, work in them. May they not believe a lie. Your word says, take heed that no man deceive you. We all pray, Father, may we truly hear your voice. Hear your word and not be deceived. We thank you, Lord, for without you we can do nothing, not a thing. We thank you. We honor you because you are moving throughout all the earth. May we honor you, Lord. Good morning from Tennessee. Thank you. Good morning. I'm standing here trying to be a good boy. <laughs> I wanted the Lord to have his way this morning, inviting Gail to just minister to you in song, praise, and worship. Mm -hmm. Glad to have my daughter visiting back from North Carolina. Mary Rebecca is with us this week, and we are glad that you're able to join us today. I hope you've got your Bibles. We're going to turn in a minute as soon as uh, we're good. I've got to, uh, Gail's going to try something different, get out of that wheelchair. So I've got to move the bench uh, where she's sitting because that's where I'm going to stand. So give us a minute. Again, we don't edit our videos. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Say good morning, Mary Rebecca. Good morning, everybody. What has the Lord done for you? He loves me. Yes, he does. It is a good thing. It is a good thing. To do what? Give thanks unto the Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for your purpose and your calling on each and every one of us. Lord, may we know you. For you are the one who sets us free. You walk us out of the darkness and you declare your truth and your faithfulness. Lord, I trust in you. You yes. are faithful and you are true. Lord, yes. may your people hear your voice. Yes. Lord, may they be set free. Lord, may they be set free in Jesus' yes. name. For you are worthy. Worthy, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. We glorify you. <laughs> this is why we call it a church without walls. We come together. We are the church. Yes, we are. That's why walls don't separate us. That God, through the technology, has allowed us to come to your house. And we thank you and invite you to come to our house in Lenore City, Tennessee. So I want you to take your Bibles. I want to read a couple of verses before I get started out of Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, I want to read to you, and I trust again that you have your Bibles. Rachel, Antonio, you got your Bibles. David, thank you, you got your Bible. Susan, you got your Bible. Thank you. If you don't have it, go get it. <laughs> yeah, you can put this video on. Unlike being in church, you can pause this video, go do what you got to do, and then get back here. You don't want to miss it today. So turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 11. I want to read a few verses here, and then I want to skip over to the book of Hebrew today. Not just reading straight through as I normally do. Today's just somewhat different. But here in Matthew chapter 11, and began reading in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, 
when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. By now, John the Baptist had been put in prison because he had told the king it was not right for him to sleep with his brother's wife. And therefore, he was thrown into prison. Uh, as you know by now that John has baptized Jesus already in the River Jordan, John, the forerunner of Jesus, has introduced Jesus to the people that this is he who was promised. Now, in verse 2, now when John had heard in prison, <laughs> no radios, no TVs, and yet John heard about Jesus doing what he was doing while John was in prison. And it's the old-fashioned way, and it's still as good as ever. There's no better advertising, I guess, than word of mouth. Now, when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and saith unto him, talking to Jesus, Art thou he who should come? Or do we look for another? Amazing. John baptized Jesus. John introduced Jesus. And now he's saying, Jesus, I'm about to die. I'm about to lose my head for the work that I've done for you. Lord, I've labored. I've been out in the wilderness a long time. I've lived a restricted life, a disciplined life. I've done everything you asked me to do. And Lord, now I'm in prison. And I probably will die here. So Lord, I want to know. I want to know. I want to know, Lord, are you the one? Are you the one that God has promised us? And look what happens in uh, Matthew 11 and verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, talking to John's disciples, go tell John, go and show John again those things which you do, that you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the dead hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Nobody, nobody in that day had done the things that Jesus was doing. And as it is written in the word, you shall know them by the fruit they bear. If they bear no fruit, then you've got honest reasons to doubt their relationship with the Lord. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 15. If they don't bear fruit, the Father prunes them. And if they continue not to bear fruit, Jesus said the Father will cut them off. Jesus said in John chapter 15, those who do bear fruit, the Father prunes them so they can bear more fruit. God has his hands full pruning people. You, watching me today, you are being pruned. Mm -hmm. Eddie, Paul, and Gail, and Rebecca, we are being pruned. Yes. And I want to tell you, Rebecca can tell you, Gail can tell you, I can tell you, pruning hurts. Pruning is disappointing when you think you should go to the left and the Lord sends you to the right. 
when you think you should live on 3rd Avenue and you have to live on 4th Street. When you think you should marry this man and God puts another man in your life or woman because God has a plan. Today, I know that some of you are weeping. You have been crying out to God and he sees your tears. He hears your prayers. Yes, he does. But he's going to do what's best for you. That's who he is. He has to. He is Lord. He is. So turn with me now to uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And I want to start reading in verse 1. And for those of you who may be watching our videos for the first time, you know that we do not edit our videos. I'm a crybaby. And when I cry, my nose runs. So I ask you to forgive me because I can't cut that part out of the video. Maybe one day I'll inherit an editor <laughs> who can. Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Pay attention to what you've heard. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Some people have little faith. Some people have less faith. They don't read or listen to the teaching and or preaching of the word. They're lazy. They want somebody else to study the Bible and tell them what it says. Now, Gail will tell you, I do not like to read long letters, emails. I confess sometimes when I get an email and it's a long, 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 long email, I don't even read it. That's why I've asked people for a long time, keep it brief, to the point, and then if there is room for discussion, I'll contact you back and we'll talk about it. But don't approach me the first time with a book. Chances are I will not read. When Gail sometimes will show me a book and she'll say, you need to read this book. My answer has been, you read it and tell me what it says. I remember a long time ago when the Lord called me to be a preacher, I thought, but Lord, why call me to be a preacher? I don't like to read. But he called me anyway. And I have read this book time and time and time again, not because I like reading it or reading, but out of necessity. I read it because I need to. I'm a preacher. However, whether you're a preacher or not, you need to find out what's in this book for yourself and not depend on what other people tell you because sometimes they're not right. They're not listening. They're they have watered it down in order to tickle your ears. And I'm sorry to say it, but there's going to be a lot of people in hell who went to church every Sunday, heard every sermon. But you know the amazing thing about that, having been a pastor? I can preach the first Sunday of the month and on the second Sunday of the month, I can ask somebody, what did I preach last Sunday? And they don't remember. But it was a good word. <laughs> and here, Hebrews says, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Look at this. Lest at any time we should let them slip. Did you know the Bible says we leak? Did you know what you hear 
leaks out. That's why we need to read it again and again and again. Most of the scriptures that I have memorized has come from reading and repeating them again and again and again. I don't set reading anything to memory. That's not my intentions to memorize. I can't even quote all of the 23rd Psalms yet, and I'm 70. I know what it says, but if you ask me to quote it, I'll probably miss part of it. I didn't learn to memorize it as a child like most. But the Bible says that when we listen, we need to pay more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip, leak out. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, God don't miss nothing. How shall we escape? Look at this, Hebrews 2 and 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? As I've said it before, there's a lot of people in church that are not in Christ. Sadly, those people cannot go to heaven. They're in church but they're not in Christ. How can we escape if we neglect so great salvation? As Peter was sharing in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, there's no other name. There's no other name wherein a man might be saved than the name of Jesus. So let me ask you today, do you know Jesus or do you just know who he is? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. You see, the disciples walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They listened to Jesus. They saw what Jesus did and they shared it. They repeated it. They told others what they had learned from Jesus. That's the way of the gospel. For many years, back when I was a young boy, people would stand up on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night and what we called, they would testify. they would testify of what God has done for them. And over the years, because the churches have compromised, they can't allow that anymore because many people, when they would stand up to testify, would just gossip. They would tell what their family and neighbors had done or their spouse or their children. And preachers had to stop doing that because they no longer were giving God the glory. But that's one of the best ways you can witness to somebody. That's to testify of what God has done for you. He saved you. He healed you. He delivered you. He set you free from the chains of sin. You can tell people about that instead of telling them the bad thing. They don't want to hear the bad things. They got enough of them all their own. Verse 4, Hebrews 2 and 4, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts, plural, notice that, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. I've been raised Pentecostal since the day I was born. There have been a lot of poor teaching about the gifts of the Holy Ghost, I hear people frequently asking for the gifts, and I don't think it's wrong to do so, but the Bible says that God gives gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. It's not what you want. It's what does God want for you? For even the Apostle Paul in Corinthians says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, Preachers, 
pastors, Paul went so far as to say, do all that have the Spirit of God speak with tongues? And the answer is no. Not everybody baptized in the Holy Ghost speaks in tongues. Only those that the Father has chosen and given them the gift of tongues. That's why they can't all do it. And if you try to fabricate it, if you try to make it happen, if you try to, as I've been in some churches where the speaker would say, if you don't know how to speak in tongues, repeat after me. That's not of God. You don't need man to teach you to speak in tongues. The Holy Ghost knows exactly what he's doing. And if you say, well, Brother Eddie, my church just don't believe in tongues. Well, that's between you, your church, and your God. But when you read the Bible, tongues, the interpretations of tongues, faith, uh, healing, miracles, all of these are gifts, plural, of the Holy Ghost, and God gives them to those according to his will. They are not for everybody. As you have seen, and so have I, that some preachers, when God gives them a gift, they sell it. If God gives them the ability to preach, they record a sermon, put it on a CD, and sell it. Or, if God has given them a life of uh, works, they write it all in a book and sell it. I remember not long ago, Gil and I were together at lunch when the Lord spoke to me and said he was looking for somebody that would not sell him. He's not for sale. Jesus told the disciples, freely ye have received, freely give. I don't know a person's relationship with the Lord if they put their ministry up for sale. If a preacher has to have a certain number of dollars to come to your church, don't invite him. If a singer has to have so much money to come to your church, don't invite him. They've turned it into a business, not a ministry. I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, so he goes on to say in verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak, he has not put the world that's coming in subjection to the angels, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? It's kind of like the song that I have sung for so many years. Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Listen at this, talking about Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thine hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, listen at this, he left nothing. He left nothing that is not put under him. Rebecca? Yes, <laughs> he left nothing that is not put under him. Everything is under him. The devil's under him. The demons are under him. Hell is under him. He is Lord of all. Yes, he is. And he's mighty. But now we see not yet all things put under him. There's some things coming. Right now, the devil, as the Bible says, is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, running to and fro around the world. To kill, to steal, to destroy, that's his job. But his day is coming. His days are numbered. You know and I know that when Christ comes back, Satan is going to be bound by a chain and one angel, just one angel, that's all it's going to take, to bind him with a chain, cast him into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. 
while Jesus sets the things in order in the world. Imagine what it's going to be like without a devil for a thousand years. And then the Bible says he'll be loosed for a season, gather up an army, go against God. God will destroy him with the words out of his mouth and he will forever be cast into the lake of fire with all of his followers. They'll burn together. So some of the things are not yet under him, but they soon will be. He goes on to say in verse 9, but we see Jesus, Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, listen at this, that he, Jesus, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. There's nothing you could suffer that he hadn't already. He knows what you're going through. Look at this, verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings with an S on it. Did you hear what the Bible says? That even Jesus was made perfect by his sufferings? And we wonder why we suffer? Because we are being perfected. We suffer to be perfected. Also in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus and says, Though he were a son, yet learned, learned he obedience by the things he suffered. Unfortunately, it is our destiny to suffer for Jesus' sake. He was perfected by his sufferings, and so shall we be. So don't think God's mad at you when you suffer. Don't think God has washed your name out because you don't hear from him. You don't see him. You don't feel him. You're learning. You're learning to walk by faith. Faith is when you can't see it. Faith is when you can't hear it. <laughs> faith is when you can't feel it. He's still there. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere and he's Lord. He's king, he's savior, he's redeemer, he's everything this book says he is. That's why he comes on the scene and says, fear not. Fear not, you've got nothing to be afraid. Yeah, you're in the darkness. Yeah, you can't feel it right now, but you're just as safe as if you could. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He suffered like we suffered. We're going to suffer like he suffered. That's why Jesus said, He that is not willing to deny himself, take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now, Jesus was literally nailed to a cross on Golgotha's hill, naked before the world. A crown of thorns was beaten to a pulp that the shedding of his blood would wash away all our sins. Should he expect any less of you? Or me? All right, you lost your job. You haven't lost your life. You lost a husband or a wife. You haven't lost your life. You've had to move. But you haven't lost your life. 
My Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, in all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Your pain and suffering are working to make you better, to make you who God wants you to be. Make you able to endure to the end. Amen, Gail. Did you hear that? Thank you, Lord. God is teaching us to endure so that we will be able, when the time comes, to endure to the end. Thank you, Father. Jesus told his disciples that his Father had given him a legion of angels to set him free if he so called on them. And I thank him almost every day that he did it. Jesus could have stopped them from putting him on the cross. Jesus could have stopped Pilate from scourging him, whipping him. Jesus could have stopped all that. But if Jesus had, no man could be saved. And he knew it. So it was his love for us that he endured the cross. So let me ask you today. Are you willing to endure your sufferings for his glory? You remember when Lazarus died and Jesus waited four days? Jesus waited four days so he could raise Lazarus from the dead for the glory of God so that God would receive the glory from Lazarus' resurrection. Sometimes God has to let us suffer and die to self for the glory of God. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? Like I was telling Rebecca the other night, when it hurts, sing Sing, for God inhabits the praises of his people. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Trust him. Remind me of that song we used to sing in the church, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus. Thank you, Gail. To be happy in Jesus, trust. except to trust and when you've learned to trust him no matter what, when you've learned to obey him no matter what, you can really be happy. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also, Jesus himself likewise, took part of the same that through death, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. He was made a little lower than the angels to suffer death that he might have power over death and the devil and deliver them, look at this, who through fear of death were all their life subject to bondage. For deliver, and deliver them who through fear of death, there's no need for you and me to fear death. Death is nothing but a doorway to heaven, a doorway into the presence of God, a doorway from being mortal to put on immortality. Don't be afraid to die. If you're ready to meet the Lord, you shouldn't be afraid to die. I've read the last words of sinners and some of them feel the flames licking around their feet and legs before they die. They know it's coming because they rejected Christ. But if you're in Christ, you should have no fear of death. As Jesus said, no fear of what man can do unto you. There's no need to be afraid. Even though you can't see the light of the day, he is the light of day. As I was sharing with Rebecca, even though the day is cloudy and raining and dreary, the sun is still shining above the clouds. And God stands above the clouds. 
He sees you where you are. If you can't see him, he hears you when you can't hear him. He knows you're weeping when you don't know he knows you're weeping. The Bible says not so much as a sparrow can fall to the ground, but what it gets the attention of Almighty God. And if a sparrow can get the attention of God, how much more, he says, are you worth than many sparrows? You see, one of the things about humans, we have no idea how valuable, how precious we are, how priceless we are in the sight of God. Because we have been bought and paid for by the precious blood of his only begotten son, Jesus. No one else has died for you. That's what John the Baptist was saying. Are you the one? I'm telling you, he is the one. He is and was and always will be. And this same Jesus, the angel said to the disciples, he's coming back. Hang in there. Hang on. He's coming back. For verily he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. See, he knew that the sins of man separated us from God. So he came and lived and died and shed his blood so that we could be reconciled, so that we could be uh, reacquainted with the Father. Look at this in verse 18. I close Hebrews 2 and 18. For in that he himself who? Jesus. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. And what came to the top of the list for me when it said he suffered and uh, being tempted, able to secure us who suffered People are being tempted today like never before to quit. They haven't gotten the answers to their prayers yet and they're being tempted to quit. The devil is whispering in their ears, it ain't happened by now, it ain't going to, and he's a liar. God may very well do tomorrow what you have believed for 40 years. I'm reminded sometimes when Moses found the burning bush out in the wilderness, he was not looking for a burning bush. He was tending the sheep. You just do your business. Jesus said, occupy. Stay busy till I come. He'll show you what you need to see. He'll tell you what you need to know. He'll lead you where you need to go if you'll just trust him and obey him and praise him and worship him and acknowledge him. A verse of scripture I quote every morning, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And you need to underline it and you need to quote it every day. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. All of it, not some of it. Trust in the Lord, not yourself, not mom, not dad, not your husband, not your wife, and definitely not our sorry government. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, but in all of your ways. Everything, all of your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Amen. He'll see to it you get where he wants you to be. Can 
Can't you just let go and let God have his way? Can't you trust him? You can't make it happen yourself. Amen, Gail. You can't make it happen without him. For I quote that every morning too. The Bible says without him, we can do nothing. But listen to me. The Bible also says, and I quote this one every morning, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, who gives me the strength to do it. You can do what God's called you to do because you're trusting God to provide you the strength, the wisdom, the money if you need it. You have to trust him and not yourself. In our flesh, we are not trustworthy. The Bible says our hearts are desperately wicked. The Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood. When you're having a problem with your son-in-law, when you're having a problem with your daughter-in-law, <laughs> when you're having a problem with your mother-in-law, it's not the flesh, it's principalities working in them and through them to get, make it a hard time for you. Have you read that scripture that says iron sharpens iron? Let me ask you a question today. Who did God put in your life to sharpen you? Who is it that rubs you the wrong way? Have you ever stopped to think that God put them there yes. to make you stronger? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all of your ways. Acknowledge him. Put him first. And he shall direct your steps. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up every man, woman, boy, and girl brave enough to watch our video and Father, I pray today that the Spirit of God will take this word, send it to and fro all over the world, and may it accomplish your will and bear much fruit for your glory, Lord. Father, I pray that you would send the conviction of the Holy Ghost upon those who are not ready to meet you. And Lord, I pray that they will repent of their sins, ask for forgiveness, and get ready to meet the Lord face to face. Save the lost, heal the sick, cast out devils, Lord, and raise the spiritually dead back to life again. Father, I pray today that the Holy Ghost will breathe on people and raise them up. Put back life that has faded. Put it back, Lord. Fix it. Renew in them a right relationship with God. Renew within them a heart that's right before God. Oh, Lord, every day, every day, Lord, draw us closer to you. Accomplish your will in us. Help us, Lord, to bear much fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And Father, there are several families right now that communicate with me that they need to move. And Father, I pray right now, along with all the believers watching this video, that we'll join our hands, we'll join our hearts, we'll join our voices together to help them find a safe place to live soon, Lord, before it's too late. Because it is written, where two or more agree is touching anything, it shall be done. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. I read your emails. I read your comments. I love to read your cards and letters. 
especially when they're short. <laughs> and we do pray over you every day. That's a part of what we do. But Gail and I thank you with all of our hearts that you are praying for us. Our kids, this ministry. Three years ago, we weren't here. We only started this ministry in April of 2020. So we are approximately two and a half years on the internet. A church without walls. And we thank you for attending church today. Yes. And if by any means, the music, the preaching, the prayer, if any of it has been a blessing to you, will you be so kind as to share it so that it will go farther, faster? For the Bible says, when the gospel is preached into all the world, then the end will come. I'm praying for some of you like you don't know. Cecilia in El Salvador. I'm praying for you and Isabel. Rachel in Great Britain. I'm praying for you and your family. Laura in Puerto Rico. I'm praying for you and your family. The Killing Mark family in Washington, I'm praying for you. Many, 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 many others. There's so many I had to write them down in a book. And I take that book out and open it and I call out your name every day in prayer. And sometimes I pause and praise fervently for you when I feel that need every day. That's a part of my regiment. I do that before I eat breakfast. Denise, I'm praying for you. Yvonne, I have not ceased to pray for you. She is lifted up before the Lord in the middle of the night. Thank you, Lord. My friends in the Philippines, I'm praying for you. Australia, I'm praying for you. My friends in Canada, I'm praying for you. All over Great Britain, the Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, England, France. I'm praying for you. And all across the United States of America, I'm praying for you. You know and I know a week from now, chances are the election will be over. I don't know if any wrongdoing is going to happen, I don't know if the results are going to be real and true. I don't know. It seems like if whichever side wins, the other side's going to want to fight. So chaos is coming to America, no matter who wins. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Stay ready. As Jesus said, when you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So on behalf of me and Gail and our ministry, we thank you for your prayers and for the blessings that you give to us. So God bless you until Saturday morning.